That's just a big thing about HBCUs not having as much diversity as or diversity as um, college, uh, as predominantly white colleges. And the truth is, they really do. It brings your body to a balance where okay. like everything is at peace. peace. I don't want to say peace, but like it's at you know it's normal state. Whatever, but with homeopathy, they get the whole person, and then they like give you what you need for that. Hmm. You know. So not it's not just one thing, it's it's everything about you. It's a two hour interview, mm. and for the rest of the time you just talk about your life, like what's stressing you out, what's your what's your cravings, what what do you do on a daily day basis? Are you generally stressed out? And then they make this remedy out of like five thousand options. You're limited to what they can tell you about how they process our food, yeah. and you're limited to what you can know. So what you think you're eating, like what it says on the back of here, it's not all what you're eating. Um, Research, official, valid, rigorous research, takes context out of it, takes people out of it, mm. when that's not really how things work. Everything that we eat, or like all our fruits and vegetables, could be genetically modified. They I said it's that. stuff that they cannot tell us. Mm -hmm. And that's what they said in my article also. They was like, it's information that they cannot tell us. With the rising perinatal health disparities that currently exist, um, we've essentially lost to a certain extent, our ability to create beloved children again. What women need now and how things used to be done and how things are being done now. Really trying to restore that so we can have our beloved children again. Yeah, she said um, during the civil rights movement and stuff, like when we think about it, we think it was older people. Like when you think about Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King, we think they were like in their 40s. But she said they were actually, it was like teenagers and people our age doing it. So this is our team, right? This is uh, Miss Bianca is here, Jorge and myself, Phoebe is in the crowd, Nisi and Andrew. Um, this is really our team of Youth Prize Research. And we have kind of a unique structure because we're a funder, right? So we, uh, we're an intermediary, we bring in big grants and we make a lot of grants to small organizations. But what we found was that there was this kind of unique space that we could exist in uh, in our research department where we could bring in revenue through contracts um, with mainstream government, other organizations, do more or less liberal work. Uh, sometimes it can be more radical, but you know, usually there's prescription that comes with funding. But what we found was that if we bring this in um, through contracts and as a youth research team, which apparently there's really high demand for, we could make grants to more radical organizations, such as the folks who are with us, to do really radical participatory action research. And that's who we're going to hear from uh, today as well as one of the projects that we do at Youth Press. So, with that, we want to welcome up Wakanyeje Tehinda. After the War of 1862, U.S. soldiers forced marched 1,700 women, children, and elders 150 miles to a concentration camp at Fort Snelling. They paraded people like trophies through the white towns. Enraged, a white settler woman broke through the soldiers and ripped a Dakota baby from its mother's breast and proceeded to dash its head against the ground. The baby, once it was returned to its mother, died and was placed in the crook of a tree in the absence of the usual funerary ceremonies. The longer a tribal nation is is exposed to Western civilization, the worst, the, the worst and broke outcomes became. 
This was observed in 1883 by a white obstetrician serving Indian agent doctors in the middle of the concentration camp era, where the protectors are men who are shackled and unable to prevent the rape, murder, coming out at night under an American banner. Boarding school came hot on its heels, stealing children to brainwash them into acting as healthcare objects rather than powerful children of a red nation. How many red children kidnapped to be put in white homes to socialize them out of being Indian and into capitalist America and its medical industrial complex? And don't think Indian health service is any better. 50% of Indian women sterilize without their knowledge or consent. With a list of offenses this long, how can we wonder why our mamas are more likely to die from the same complications as the general population or that our babies die two and a half times more often? Recovering the traditional knowledge is a, is a very important thing. We as Dakota women have, a cer have lost certain traditional ways. We no longer call the children that have survived traumatic experiences the beloved children. We, are, we no longer nurture them to our full capability, not because we don't want to, but because we don't know how to. Bringing back this knowledge can change lives and do wondrous things. There are things in this world that are not often discussed very much, so when that subject comes up, people think it's not normal in reality it is. Things won't get better unless we do something about it. What I want to get out of, out of this project is for the personal experience and to help benefit others using information from this project to help people. <coughs> I'm Esmeralda. I'm Ariana. And we are the Wakanya Jeff Tehindaki Project. Um, do you guys want to stay up here with me? Uh, no, I'll stay up. Okay, cool. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, we're a project primarily working on, um, well, we're in the opening phase of a research project where we're doing a community needs assessment um, with these young researchers, going through Dakota communities and interviewing people about not only their traditional but also contemporary healthcare experiences, their childbirth, their access to reproductive care, and the things that they would rather improve upon or get rid of altogether. We chose the name, it's up here, but I'm going to rewrite it just so you all can see it. Wakayaja Tehindapi. This is probably one of the first times that this language has been heard on this land base in a very long time. I'd like to remind you all that you all stand on indigenous land that was taken in Detroit. All of it. As such, our indigenous languages are not often heard on our homelands anymore, so it's always important for us to use these terms. We chose this term because it means beloved child. A long time ago when we had children who would undergo traumatic experiences, if they got really, really sick, if they were the only child for whatever reason, they were often given this title, beloved children, and they were painted red. They were lavished with gifts over the course of their life. They were given opportunities. People adored them. They, they opened doors for them. They did everything they possibly could for these children. And as consequence, they were held to a much higher social expectation. They were expected to be that much more giving that much more grateful for what they received. They were expected to be that much more dedicated to the survival and protection of their indigenous nation. So, this word right here is usually translated as baby or child. I'm just going to write that here. Now, tehindapi or tehinde is a word that's a little bit more difficult to translate. They talk about it in such a way, there's not really a love in Dakota, it's usually kind of a more English thing. Most languages don't actually have love. But this is like to treasure, in the way that we treasure our children, in the way that we treasure you know, the loved ones that we hold around us. We, we hold them close, and we do everything we can to take care of them. And so this word literally means they treasure him or her, or first person, or Third person, gender, gender neutral pronoun, because we don't really have him or her in the program. Um, and so we chose this name specifically in order to try and bring back these beloved children. Hello, everyone. Um, yes. And so through this project, we're looking to kind of come together with a collection of the community needs that exist in, um, that exist in Dakota communities in southern Minnesota today. Things like your preconceptional health care, your prenatal care, your 
interpartum, your postpartum, breastfeeding support, and general reproductive care for people in general. So we can start creating this category of children. We can start bringing these things back. Um, and what makes it really unique having these young women as doing this, doing this program and being a part of this research is that we hope to actually implement these types of programs through our organization to actually serve them and their friends and family members as they grow older and move into the reproductive stages of their lives. So, that's us. research team sponsored by Youth Prize and Neighborhood Hub. Our research focuses on the food we consume, social and mental health, and access to fresh produce. We interview people in North Minneapolis to tell the stories of our people. Too much power. What do we see? Uh, too much, too much. Too much power. <laughs> Superhero. Defense? I don't know. I had to look at you. It seemed like you trying to scope them. West Broadway is a 2.3 mile long strip of road traveled by a lot of people within and without the community daily. It's the main vein of Minneapolis. It consists of 23 places to get something fried, fast, and fattening. Minneapolis has many factors contributing to its unhealthy habits. These factors include food access, food production, gentrification, policing, and medical opportunities. Right. 
Okay. Yeah. Well, there's a set of like norms and access to your community. Mm -hmm. So one step is to get like what's in your community and that affects your health. Right. And then there's also just kind of what are people doing in your community and you kind of get in that cycle and you get used to doing what they're doing and it just kind of becomes <coughs> part of the culture. Right. Can does this sound moving down a little bit actually? He's like shooting the desk. Wait, honestly, wait, wait, what's happening with that we have to move? There's more people coming. Oh, okay. Well, well, space in the middle. Like what? Oh. This is the next gym. And you guys, you guys can spread out a little. Yeah. Spread out. Should we like raise one? Yeah. Alright, yeah. yeah. stop, stop. You were all just gentrified. <laughs> oh, you broke. You broke. You can't just move me like that. The idea of gentrification. No one's coming. The idea of gentrification. <laughs> of policing our communities is like, it happens so subtly. They're just like, oh, yeah, it's okay, they're just telling us, it's, it's fine. And everyone does it. There's only like, one person like, that um, does. Yeah, only a couple people have issues that everyone's like, <laughs> and it's, it's super subtle. That's the idea of gentrification. Gentrification, for a broad term, is moving out people to bring in other people because they're seen as more important. So, yeah. So, um, before the session started, we asked Nisi and patients to participate with us. We asked Nisi to go against us and tell us no, she's not moving. I wasn't being a jerk. <laughs> it was involuntary. I'm and, sorry. And um, we asked patients to go along with us and be like, oh yeah, I'll go, and then try to get more people to come to that direction with her. you can kind of see, um, this is the greenway that they've proposed. It's a new bike path that they want to build in North Minneapolis. Um, cuts right through there, and you can kind of see, uh, the next few photos will show what they're trying to really build out um, as this becomes a more appealing space to a very specific type of uh, individual they want to move in. It is a building Twin Cities landmarks. <laughs> For who? Uh, Whose landmarks? Whose landmarks? Down here, that's that this is happening, and it, and if they build the greenway up, we kind of are expecting that this would go up, this would flow up um, on this map. Cool. Yeah. Also, in Minnesota, there also, I mean, there has been a gentrified act, or it has already been gentrified in St. Paul, Minnesota, where they it's called the Rondo community, where they built the highway right through an African American community, in wanted everybody to move from that area and just move somewhere else. So, yeah. Um, interesting, uh, interesting tidbit, uh, little tidbit about that was that was a, actually a traditionally black, historically black community in St. Paul that got kind of displaced by this highway. It's the same type of situation in North Minneapolis, a historically black community that's getting kind of displaced by all these different developments. And the local economy is there as well. It was a thriving local. Yeah, a lot of black owned businesses were doing very well economically, so then the government came up with this brilliant idea to build a highway right through it, to separate the streets from each other, so basically divide the community altogether. Yeah, they, uh, they did that same thing in Nashville and Johnson Street, You got, if you guys are familiar with it, it's by Fisk University and other HBCU. They had uh, black businesses there and they were, the community was actually coming up. And the houses were getting better and everything, and they um, put a highway right through it the same way you guys are talking about, and it ruined everything. Mm -hmm. So that basically slows down like businesses and, and like all types of stuff. 
it destroys them pretty much. It, it destroys them. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's your tune to trending. That's I-375 down half for folks who are interested in finding out more about the city history. That's Black Bottom and Paradise Valley. And recently torn down, uh, or getting torn down through some of these projects over in between the Eastern Market District and Front Park. So yeah, that's it. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And um, we're focusing on food myths and food access. Yeah. All right. So on West Broadway, which was that uh, area in North Minneapolis, uh, there's corner stores and liquor stores that are walking distance no matter where you go. Well, there are only three grocery stores in North Minneapolis and all of North Minneapolis. What is shown up here is the the like kind of the milk and apple. And then out of those three, one of them is a grocery outlet, which only sells expired products. Um, society tells us that to be, or to be healthy and do healthy things, but sells us food that's killing us. In 2006, city authorities discovered that 36% of local corner stores, which is about on every corner of uh, the West Broadway Street, uh, did not have any fresh produce, and the rest had produce that was limited. But for people who can make it to these grocery stores, the three that are available, uh, it tends to be a costly thing. So whether you can afford to buy healthy foods or to buy junk food, junk food tends to be a lot cheaper. And for a low-income family that's living paycheck to paycheck, you know, cheaper is kind of the way to go. Um, Minnesota, specifically one half of Minneapolis and then one third of St. Paul, makes America's worst nine urban food deserts, which, do you guys know what a food desert is? Yeah. Food deserts in the article News for One Black America. However, North Minneapolis is taking steps to change that. We're building food markets. We're having uh, organizations like Appetites for Change to get fresh produce, which the Ariana is a part of. It's part of the sweetie pie. Yeah, Project Sweetie Pie, which is um, having kids learn how to cook fresh produce. And we also are in the cooking class. And we're making steps to change our lack of access to uh, fresh produce. Mm. Oh. So like here is one of the three grocery stores. This is Cub Foods, which I don't know if that's <laughs> Well, it's, <laughs> what, it's widely known in Minnesota. And specifically, the Cub Foods in North Minneapolis, their product placement is a lot different than wherever else you go. Usually, the first thing that you do when you walk in is you get to the fruits and vegetables and the fresh produce. In North Minneapolis, the first thing you see is donuts, cookies, bags of chips, and they're all for sale. You know? So this is a picture that this is right when you walk in. They bombard you with unhealthy uh, products. Which is awesome. That was random to say, dude. <laughs> Which is also saying, who this is for. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then also, we looked at North Minneapolis and we compared it to Northeast Minneapolis, which basically has that same road, which is West Broadway, and it's separated by a bridge. So it's right on 94. So once you cross it, this is Northeast. Wait, yeah, this is Northeast and then this is North Minneapolis. Over here you have several different grocery stores. I see at least five, as well as um, different organic uh, restaurants. And then the points are corner stores. That's a lot of corner stores. So right here, looking at this, this clump of, of symbols oh, is West Broadway. What did you say? Oh, is West Broadway? Oh, you can take <laughs> Sorry. Is West Broadway. So instead of having a lot of grocery stores, we have a lot of fast food, which symbolizes the burger and the milkshake. 
and they're all right across the street from each other. So a lot of people, what they have access to is Burger King, Taco Bell, McDonald's, Popeyes, and they're all right next to each other. Mm -hmm. Whereas to get to a grocery place, if you a grocery store, and you don't even have a car, it's virtually impossible. Versus on the other side, there's a lot more opportunities for different things. What's up? What are the martini glasses? The martini glasses, <coughs> those are liquor stores. Liquor stores and bars, which also are very um, prominent in the West Broadway area. So the majority on that strip is the liquor stores, the fast food places, and the farm stores. What are the hearts? The hearts are their alternative health care, which is like chiropractic. Dentists. Well, the dentist is the tooth, but yeah. Okay. Okay. Remember when you were a little kid and everyone told you to eat and told you what to eat and what not to eat? Eat your grains, eat your fruits, don't have a lot of sugar. In middle school, they showed you a diagram in health class, also known as the food pyramid, of what foods to eat and the amount of food that should be in your, on your plate. In reality, the food pyramid is a food tool, because the food today is created based off of the amount of produce that a company could create, such as enriched refined grains, which are white breads, bagels, pasta, pretzels, chips, cereals, and pre-cooked bread. The white flour used in all of these is made of bleach, which you use in your clothes. Vegetable oils are really not oils. Putting, putting these into your diet can increase cancer, heart disease, promote dysfunctional things to the immune system, and more. Low fat, 1% and 2% milk are all made of powder, or all contain powdered milk and slime, which we are the consumers of. The list keeps going on. Soy and soy products, processed meats, chicken burgers, turkey burgers, raised eggs, etc. All that you, you're eating, you will never expect what could be in it. Not only as consumers are we ignorant of what we eat, but also companies mislead us into products that convinces people to buy something they don't need in the name of health, such as Cheerios. You eat Cheerios to lower your cholesterol when reality is ruining women's chances of who, part of women's chances who wants children a possibility to commit a crime or have behavioral problems because of the record of people in memory loss. Having high cholesterol can improve your, improve your chances of not having these problems and protect you from infections, and you can be four times less likely to contract AIDS. These are just some of the things that it can do, and many more you would be surprised about. With that cholesterol, we would not function well. According to the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, food can contain contain trans fat and the amount doesn't have to be listed on all foods of McDonald's and other fast foods. We all know that McDonald's is not good for us, but people debate that purchasing this is cheaper than purchasing healthy products and making a meal out of it. We calculated the difference between a Big Mac meal feeding five versus what we made with our cooking class, which was eggplant parmesan that amounted to feed over 20 people. Eating this is better than bad cholesterol, diabetes risk, and damaging DNA. If you want to live a long life, eat foods with a short shelf life. Food is required to live. I mean, we can't live and not eat. But healthy food should be a right, not a luxury. So, pretty much to explain that poem, I 
I was in school one day and I had a sharp pain, like this really, really sharp pain going from the bottom of my left foot all the way up to my armpit, my left armpit. And my left arm and my right leg was numb, like I couldn't feel it. I had heartburn and I had like liver pain. So I went to the school nurse and I told her what was wrong with me and she was like, well, I can't really help you. And then I got home and I called the nurse was it, nurse hotline or something like that. I called the nurse hotline and they were like, well, I've never seen symptoms like yours, so you need to go to the doctor because I can't help you. So then I went to the doctor, third visit, by the way. I went to the doctor and the doctor was like, oh, you have a cold. You're just, you have <laughs> symptoms of a cold. You're fine. You're okay. I wanted to punch him in his face. <laughs> like, how am I quite, how am I okay when my liver hurts, my heart hurts, I'm numb, feel pain, like, and I have a cold? Are you serious? Are you doing your job right? You need to go back to school. <laughs> so I, yeah, I wanted to say that so bad. And then I went to the doctor again. I went to the hospital. And they gave me an ultrasound. And the doctor said, she was like, oh, I can't see your liver. So, you're, you're good. There's no <laughs> I can't. She was like, your rib cage, I just can't find it. You're fine. You're fine. It's okay. And I was like, oh, wow. I'm fine. That's, that's nice. Okay. And it's amazing how the healthcare system doesn't look at the food system and how the food system doesn't look at the healthcare system. So, I have a question for you. And I want you to just sit and ponder and think about it, you know. Um, institutional racism, what does that mean in the medical system? Before we close, if you can see here on the on the map where the kind of clinics or healthcare clinics are, there's three in North Minneapolis on, across the river, and then there's a few alternative healthcare practitioners. Whereas in Northeast, there's like probably 15 in like a five block radius. And um, from our interviews, all of the results of the people we've talked to have all said that these are bad experiences uh, with all of these different clinics from what we're seeing. Angry, sad, 
Why was I not told about such places? A place with black faces, black minds, our times. Our time of oh wait. Our time is of the essence. Let us not spend it carelessly. Spend moments near your people, your culture, and love them endlessly. <coughs> a place where you can learn to laugh, grow, and feel at home. Take me to the, to the place of paradise my imaginations come to know. They say we lack diversity, the type that is only visible to the eyes, that don't see further than their lenses can take them, as if being black makes us all synonymous to one another. Black is beautiful, beautiful from Chicago to Detroit, to Kenya to Nigeria. We are all as one with different backgrounds. But yet we are still proud and inspired, receiving the education we desire on our people. Articles and guest speakers were sticking to us more than the teachers. What we don't need is more appreciation is to <coughs> start practice and learn different tactics. So, hi guys. I'm Tasia. I'm Amanda. I'm Sophia. And um, we're part of INCAD, which is um, the network for the development of children of African descent. And um, we're taking this class right now. Well, it's ended, but we've been doing it for the past year. And it's basically, we're, we're all high schoolers, except for Sophia just graduated. And we're, so we basically... So basically, we are getting college credit in high school, and um, so this class we're learning about African history, African studies, and community research. So this is some of our research that we've been doing. We're going to share with you guys today. So based off what Tasha said, does anybody know what an HBCU is? Historically. Oh yeah, also known as a historically black college <laughs> university. I'm going to be um, introducing three facts about them. For one, HBCUs make up 3% of higher education institution, but graduate 20% of blacks. Also, HBCUs were created to educate freed slaves, and Higher Education Act defined HBCUs as accredited colleges that were established before 1964. Our research question was why you in St. Paul don't have access to historically black colleges. And we came up with that question because one of our students who was during the class with us, who is here today, she actually had just like toured a HBCU and she shared like her experience with all of us. And like some of us didn't like know much about it, so we wanted to learn more and why. Like find out the reason why we don't know about HBCUs. Um, the things we did to collect data was, for one, we went to HBCUs. What we did is we just uh, visited different colleges and observed the atmosphere. Another thing we did was we interviewed people. We interviewed alumni, representatives, and administrators. We also gave surveys to our peers, and in the surveys they had questions like, were you planning to go to college? Did you have anybody in your family that went to college, or did you know anything about an HBCU? Also, we read articles which we were able to obtain information about why they could be declining and statistics about how many students are graduating or going there. And we also went to a HBCU college fair where there was just a whole bunch of HBCUs just informing us about their college. This is a video we documented while we were trying to figure out our research question about why there is a lack of access of HBCUs in St. Paul, and we're only going to show a little bit because of the amount of time we have. In the month of April, five Yehoro Youth Scholars went down to Atlanta and Alabama to conduct a research project. We all live in Minnesota and have little access to historically black colleges. We wanted to answer the question, why don't youth in St. Paul have access to historically black colleges? We visited four schools, including Spelman, Morehouse, Clark Atlanta, and Tuskegee University. We came down here to know, like, like what's up with HBCUs, why there's a lack of access, but it's good to know that they are actually working and they, and they have recruiters all over. Although we may not, that may not be really noticeable because we're in Minnesota, they go to the like more popular states, they still do work really hard at recruiting, which is great to hear. 
Some of the questions we asked students was why it was beneficial for black kids to attend or research historically black schools. As African Americans have progressed, uh, so to speak, in certain communities, uh, we've kind of lost our tradition as far as supporting. You know, HBC is a black business. Uh, college is a business entity. We don't support a lot of our own organizations, our own uh, communities or uh, school um, environments. But that, that's also a downfall because other institutions are supported by people of other races and other cultures. But I think that the problem is, is that we're, we, in the household, we're not teaching our students or future college students the importance of an HBCU education. So it starts in the home. Uh, families need to start talking again. Uh, giving tours at an early age. Don't start right at, you know, graduating from high school. Start maybe in sixth grade. So you have to plant that seed uh, in these students in order for them to attend an HBCU. But I also think it's important that uh, students also have this experience as far as going to historical black colleges and universities because it could be the environment, it could be a sorority, it could be a fraternity, it could be something in the community that will spark their interest even more. And I think it's just our responsibility as uh, educators and as community leaders to expose our kids to all the opportunities available. And not only here in Minnesota, but you know, uh, nationwide as well. While interviewing students, we also asked them, why did they choose an HBCU? Uh, the reason why I chose Morehouse because Morehouse develops leaders and instills in their students the necessary faith, hope, and confidence to succeed. I just felt like there is need for us to accept that we are black and to be able to, you know, go to a school that will encourage us to accept ourselves. You know, it's it's just knowing that colored people we just we just want to go to the private schools, the white schools, and yet you know, we can actually become something a private at, at schools like Spelman where black women are actually encouraged to be who they are. I know that historically black colleges offer you information that a PWI does not. They don't study what we study. They don't study all of what we study. I give my students an annotated book list of 50 African-American scholars. And I'm saying, what's, what should separate, by the time you leave here, you should have read all 50 books. You should have a knowledge that's different from theirs. You should know what they know, plus more. I tell my students that all the time. We also asked students, what were some of the pros of attending an HBCU? One pro of going to an HBCU, I feel, would be the family-oriented uh, piece. Uh, I could literally walk down the street and not know anybody, but somebody will say hi to me uh, because of the family-oriented piece. I always simply assume that every student is brilliant. I assume that every student is an honor student, whether they're actually in the honors program or not. My assumption and when I create my thesis, when I create my syllabi, I'm assuming that every student is brilliant. Um, a lot of people have misconceptions about HBCUs. Some of the big misconceptions are that uh, there's not very many, and um, actually, they are, there's 105 um, historically black colleges. And um, another misconception is that they're not going to last long. They're all shutting down. And actually, we went down south, and we figured out there, um, although they don't get funded as well as predominantly white institutions, they still get funded well enough that they're going to be around for a lot longer. And there's still students attending. And so it's going to be more time they're around. Uh, another thing we also found out was guidance counselors, they try to protect their students. And what they think they're protecting their students from is, I don't know what, but when like um, HBCU recruiters try to come to their high school, they don't allow them to come in because, because of the misconceptions of HBCUs, they feel like their students shouldn't go there and they should go to predominantly white institutions. Yeah, like she said, like earlier about the misconceptions, like people may not think that like the degree or something that they get from like HBCU is like as credible as like the degree they would get like from PWI. So, but actually, um, like there's a really high percentage of black um, 
graduates that like have like masters and they've like become like politicians and lawyers and doctors and stuff. They graduated from HBC. Um, the impact our experience had on us was like really good. Um, a lot of us went from like not knowing anything about HBCs to like knowing so much that we want to like attend one. So. Our plans for the future are to continue to speak with like groups like you guys and our peers and to just like um, further our research on like HBCUs and like uh, get more information out there. <coughs> oh, okay, I'm gonna wrap it up with a little song. <clears throat> I was born by the river in a little tent. Oh, and just like the river, I've been running ever since. It's been a long, a long time coming, but I know. groups from Minnesota. Um, dang. All right, let's give them another round of applause. So we want to move into Q&A, but really quick. Um, what we want to do in Minnesota is really continue to bring groups like these together uh, as in our role at Youth Prize. Um, through funding, we want to increase funding to be able to fund more groups like this and more uh, interesting and more radical and like as projects as they come along and as these groups continue to do their work. Um, but what we really see is coming is this kind of hub of youth research, youth participatory action research, um, where we can kind of reach out from Minnesota. You know, New York, the Bay Area, they have these kind of hubs that exist, but like when we talk about youth participatory action research, we don't often think of Minnesota. And that's really what we see as coming um, through these kind of like somewhat mainstream funders, but then also like this kind of ability to work with youth research uh, that can produce really radical results. Um, and you know, we'll see what will happen as these groups continue. So um, let's do Q and A. Um, audience questions for individual members for Youth Prize. Yeah. So I was curious. Um uh, two things. First, kind of what you drew on. So, like, how did you learn how to do YCAR, right? What did you use as model? And secondly, um, in encountering this work, oftentimes it's, it's not a school spaces, right? And so I think the question is, and moving forward, what would your recommendations be for being able to bring this work into classrooms, right? Because YCAR is done oftentimes in an out of school, out of school setting. So what, what your recommendation would be based on your expertise? Yeah, and actually, are there any Detroit Future Schools or Detroit Future Youth people here? Oh, that's you. There you go. Yeah, we've do, I, mean, we've do, I know we've done it like in Detroit. Um, there's a lot of awesome people who have kind of tried to take it up, but I, it, it's always, I'm always curious about how to do it inside of schools, you know, like, and where we find the models to be able to like build together, you know? 
So uh, as far as resources, we started out, uh, we've been doing this, David and I have been doing this for about a year and a half. Yeah. We started out coming to Youth Prize and we really, uh, as far as resources, I don't know if you know about Michelle Fryer, she's a very uh, famous kind of writer, academic, career academic, mm -hmm. and she's written a lot about uh, participatory action research, specifically about youth. So she used kind of her writers as like a model as well, how do we kind of push that within our own organization. But then beyond that, we, uh, we got some materials from the Data Center out in Oakland, California, which is another organization that does research specifically around participatory action research. And so we use like a lot of these different types of models to really kind of supplement our own types of like strategies and models. But also a lot of it was just playing experimentation, us just working as a group of youth that didn't really know what we were doing, but in the end kind of worked in our favor. So I think a lot of like the, the radical kind of experimentation, you know, a lot of the things that we do with the health disparities group wouldn't traditionally be understood as research, but as you can see, like they really are bringing forth some really kind of uh, like pretty stock data. As far as the second question you had was, you can remind me. What would you like recommend for like bringing this into inside of schools? How do you think that teachers could take this into their classrooms? Mm -hmm. uh, one thing right now that we're doing, we're working with a group of youth in, Saint, in a suburb of St. Paul, uh, Maplewood, which has historically been a predominantly white area, but until recently, like in the past 10 years, we've seen like a large influx of black families. And so what we did, we are working with uh, another organization, like they're a company that does um, teacher kind of training, stuff like that. And what we did with them is, when we came with them, we, we talked about wanting to do research, but we talked about why part as not just like a data gathering tool, <coughs> but also the youth development tool. Like if you work with some of the stuff that we've done with youth as far as like doing research, like learning how to ask questions, learning how to document, learning how to take notes, learning how to use equipment like cameras, computers, stuff like that, that's youth development in a way that's not traditionally seen in a lot of programs. We talk about leadership development, it's not usually seen as something that can actually filter into your like school experience. And so for us, we really try to model our research stuff as more than just like an activity that you can do after school. This is something that's really gonna like help you develop your own skills as a person, as a professional, but also as an academic, and just as a person holistically. It's good to be able to know how to ask questions, how to write, how to listen intentionally. Those are the skills that we're trying to teach you. The way they structured it was that they called it like this, they said that this YPAR project was a part of this larger study of the school environment, so they got this big grant, but then they kind of like added this little section that was YPAR, and just considered it a part of the larger study, so it was kind of like subtle in the way they do it. So when we come to the school, they see us as just a part of this larger teaching training organization. So it's a little bit weird in how it works, but I think it, it's a little more like soft spoken in the way yeah. that it goes yes. But Brian also had. Uh, yeah, I think, so one of the things that we do at Network for the Development of Children of African Descent, our program is actually a school university uh, community partnership. So um, our students, they, there's a big push in Minnesota to um, have high school students taking uh, getting college credits um, through programs like post-secondary enrollment options, college in the schools. Um, so what we were able to do was to, to set up a, a design where our students are taking a college course so that the, the, they're, these students right here are getting college credit through Augsburg College, um, but they're also getting, um, uh, it fulfills a high school credit as well. So it's, they're, they're not, but they're taking the class at a community organization. So it's kind of like, you get the best of each world, um, but it's not in the school. So I, I mean, to your point, that's, it's, it's tough, I think, for a lot of teachers with all of the, um, you know, the constrictions that are on educators in terms of like meeting sta certain specific standards and meeting um, and, and the, the time, because YPAR is so, it doesn't have these nice, nice neat endings. Um, you see, like, we're here in the summertime, like, there, you know, so, so it doesn't have these nice, neat endings that you need sometimes in the, in the school space, but by opening up and, and allowing them to get some of the things that they would get from the school, but to do it in a space that's a little more flexible, um, some, you know, that, I think that helps. Any questions for our presenters? For our autumn and I'm curious, what, um, what kind of like outreach and engagement are you doing? Are you recruiting youth? Is it? Are you building like relationships, or how are you? We are in the initial stages of research. So in other words, we actually just formed the the actual research project. We like just hired all of like youth participants, and so like we're right now getting into the stage of like training to begin the networking. So we're actually at like the very very beginning stages of the project. 
So just to kind of add on to that, in case you guys didn't notice, the three presenters that we had, the three uh, organizations that we have presenting here today are all at different stages of the, like, the research process. So as uh, Autumn just said, Wakanyeta Te Kindape, they've just started. They're just like, just starting, like in the ball rolling with the recruiting people, trying to train themselves, trying to find ways how to do it. Northside Health Research Group, Health Disparities, they're kind of doing this stuff. They're still doing data gathering. They're still kind of getting out in the community and trying to like get all this stuff together. But who are these partners? <clears throat> Pretty much done. And so what we felt that this offer was kind of like a look at the different kind of processes and like just the, I guess, the evolution, I guess, of a youth research project, which is many times messy and like Brian said, it doesn't really have neat, pretty endings. You know, it's hard to really kind of anticipate what can, what can come up. And that's what we feel is really kind of, uh, I guess, like a benefit of working with youth is that in that area of like unsecurity and kind of like tension, that you can get a lot of great things going on. You get a lot of great like breakthroughs in terms of like what you can gather, but you also get a lot of great relationships and you can help. People. I just got a uh, question about participatory action resource. Uh, based off the uh, game we were playing earlier, um, people had like different definitions of whatever we were talking about. What's that next step? Because like, you know, how do you read out the what's you know what you're really reading to be the truth, or and you know if it's not, you know, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And that's something that I think like it's an, a question that people have been trying to answer in academia for. I don't know, the last 2,000 years, I guess. Like, what is this? Does truth really exist? I don't know. Uh, I think for us, the big thing is acknowledging that there is such a thing as like a personal truth. You know, a truth of somebody in North Minneapolis may be a complete falsehood to somebody in Detroit. You know, so I think what we really try to do is, with participatory action research, I think the strength of it is that it's community-based. So when you have community-based research, you have information and data that's being gathered that's like. Uh, prevalent and important to the people in that community. So one thing, uh, like an example I would like to point out to is that over North Minneapolis, there are some streets that uh, are traditionally seen as more dangerous, <coughs> right? Like some areas we really don't kind of go. For somebody who's not from that area, that's something that you don't really know. You don't have any idea about that. You don't really understand that type of world. But people that live there, it's a, it's a constant reality. You really kind of know that. So those, that type of data that you can gather, that's community-based data, and that's something that is important and it's helpful to people that live there, right? So for somebody in Northeast Minneapolis, it's a completely different story. And we don't we try to have those kind of together and rub up against each other, and you can never really try to mix and have like an absolute truth. Because of, in my opinion, there isn't one. Any, any other professors want to weigh in on that or do you have any insight on um, I think there's a lot of ideas about like dissonant voices, especially in like historically oppressed communities. Um, that we are certain responses are socially conditioned. Well, all all of the responses are socially conditioned, um, and it's really a matter of I think it's a reflection rather of like a truth or not, but rather the reality of the historical oppression that we have faced as communities and the different ways that oppression has interacted. Um, like to culminate in this person's experience, whether you know it's a we would categorize it as an untruth or a truth. Um, it, it doesn't change the reality of the of the social historical context in which that person has been brought up. And like while I may you know may maintain that this is a falsehood for this person because of their experience, because of the history that has brought them to that point, they believe it to be true. And that's just as relevant research-wise as whether or not this is like actually or statistically backed up. If that makes sense. Thanks. You're right there. Um, I'm really curious if there is also an evaluation component. Um, speaking selfishly, I work in a youth program and I'm really interested in trying to shift our evaluation process from this thing that's like an adult that we contract to come in and make surveys and do whatever and um, wanting it to be more youth-led. And so I'm really curious if you guys have experience with that and also um, particularly the young people in terms of program evaluation. And it, it seems like it kind of goes hand in hand, right? Yeah, it definitely does. And it's cool because you kind of like help us in a way to our next kind of piece. That's cool. Um, about six months ago, uh, David and I were having a conversation. Uh, we had our youth, uh, our research team had just started as like five people. 
And then around like October, November, some people left, like some different situations happened. So it was just David and I. And so we're thinking about like, okay, so what's our strategy for recruitment? How can we kind of get more people in here? What are some projects you want to get involved in? Stuff like that. And then we started thinking about, well, how can we kind of influence the decisions that youth project makes? Because what we do, we did need more people on the research team. We had a larger organization that we were a part of that we couldn't just say like, hey, we need five more people, you know? So we decided to go and do a study, an internal evaluation about how the youth kind of decision-making power filters into the larger decision-making mechanism within this organization, which, you know, Youth Pride is a pretty, like, substantially well-funded organization. It's kind of a big deal. So um, <laughs> we, did a, we decided we could do, like, a survey or some other kind of more simplistic kind of methods of, like, research. We did, we said, you know, we have a small organization. There's only about 10 people in the office who just kind of work there all the time. So we, we're going to do interviews. So we did, as David and I kind of developed a set of questions along the lines of, like, okay, so, like, what do you do, like who do you answer to, what kind of decisions are made in your line of work, who do you kind of relate to in, like, in the course of like, projects. So if you get, like a grant comes in, like who do you send the grant to to sign off on it, and then who gets the grant out the door, who disseminates the money, stuff like that. And so we did these interviews, there was two rounds of 30 minute interviews each. And we went from all the way from our president, Wookie Weir, who's sitting over there, to other youth innovators in the organization, which kind of got a picture of what was going on. And so uh, that took about two weeks to do, and uh, we came back. That was actually in January. We like came back from the coordinated meeting in Detroit. We did our, our big kind of staff retreat, and we went over the data. And what we found was there was some. I don't know if you guys are familiar work with the idea of like silos. So between all the areas of work, there was a kind of like a silo, which is like a a big kind of like capsule. So each area of work was kind of encapsulated and separate from each other. So you had people who worked side by side, like next to each other, literally side by side in the office, and they didn't know what they were doing. Nobody knew what the other one was working on, particularly the youth. It was kind of misunderstood. So we had a big conversation about that. And we got, at the end of the, at the, end of the big retreat, we kind of came to the conclusion that as a staff, we needed to work better on communication. That was a big decision for us. It's communicating and making sure that we're all on the same page as far as like, what was coming in, what was going out, and our values as an organization, and what And in the six months since then, I feel like, and David can attest to this firsthand, is that for one, our staff meetings are a lot better. I don't know how many of you work in like big, large organizations, but staff meetings can be like a, you know, that kind of thing, you know? So that was another, that was one big thing that came out of it. But also just, I mean, I can just tell you firsthand, is that as a staff, we're doing a much greater job of communicating on a personal level. So I can have like a large director of one of our big kind of directors come up to me talking about her work, specifically what she does, and I get a better idea of it. We're all just doing a lot better data sharing. So that was a way that it wasn't really an evaluation as far as like, here's a grade that you get, but it was an action-based evaluation that let us have a conversation that directly led to improved like outcomes. So. It was really based on like the Sylvia Rivera Law Project's organizational design, and it, I mean their kind of organizational documents are pretty incredible. But it was basically looking at like we were able to map for every work area, like not only we didn't look at youth engagement, we looked at like where youth were actually had decision making power. So we were able to like we starred every work area that youth were either consulted with, or like were initiators, or were like veto power. And we were able to see like where that existed, and like then map kind of where our decision making power was. But so we were there, law project. And it actually led us to this new evaluation where we can look at like we're developing it now, where like we're looking at like okay, so is this work area have to do with vision or just operations? And like are young people more involved with just like the operational parts of youth prize, or is there more like integral visioning and strategic? Um, and that's what we're working on now. Um, I know there's more questions, but we also wanted to give everyone kind of a chance to mingle and meet each group because there's so many like experts, youth research experts here. Um, so Wakamija uh, Tahindafi will be over here. Uh, Uhuru Youth Scholars, you can probably come up here. And then uh, over there is the Health Disparities Research Group. We want to give everyone kind of a chance. We're going to end soon, but to just really mingle, meet these experts, and ask questions. And then we have materials for youth guys up here. Thank <laughs> you.